Hi, everybody. Welcome to another interview from the mind of a skeptical leftist. I'm your host, Corey, and this time around, my guest is Caitlin Bailey, who is um, the representative for the Old Prose Project and the host of the Oldest Profession podcast. She can describe it a little better than I can. Um, in, in the actual interview, she describes what she does and talks about the organization. And then we get into busting some myths about sex work and sex workers. And I hope that uh, you find it informative. I think it's important for people across the political spectrum to get a more nuanced view and a better understanding of the issues that face sex workers and the way that sex workers themselves want to uh, approach those issues. That's, I think, all I'm going to say. I've got, uh, I've got many interviews in the queue. Um, all, all need to be processed and edited, and my production schedule is all over the map these days. So I'm trying to get this stuff out as fast as I can. That means you're often not going to see my face in videos because that takes extra work, and I can't do that in locations where I can do just audio recording. <clears throat> so I'm going to send you over to the interview. Uh, but right before I do that, I have to say thank you for watching or listening to this and thanks for sharing this around if you do and because that helps get more views and more listeners. Uh, this show is available on all the podcast places as well as, as well as YouTube and I stream on Twitch whenever I get to the chance. I want to thank everyone who supports this show. Uh, you can see their names on the end screen of the video. But if you're listening on a podcast, that's where there's like two minutes or so of music with nothing going on. That's when the scroll, the names are appearing on the screen. Uh, so <clears throat> if you want to add your name to that list, then you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist and sign up for one dollar per month or if you're in canada that's a dollar fifty that gets you access to a special patron chat room on the discord server as well as extra long video the occasional early access and of course my deep and heartfelt thanks if you want to contribute but don't want to commit to a monthly payment, then you can send a one-time donation to buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. And if you can't afford to send any money, then just share the show around. Give it a thumbs up on YouTube or a five-star rating or a review on the podcast app of your choice, as well as Podchaser. Anyway, I think that's everything. Thank you so much for being here, and I hope you enjoy the interview. <laughs> All right. Hi and welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm joined by uh, Caitlin Bailey from The Old Prose Project. Thanks for joining me. <laughs> Good. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so Yeah, sorry. I, I'm the, the founder and executive uh, director of Old Prose. And so we perfect. are a nonprofit media organization focused on creating the conditions to change the status of sex workers in society. <laughs> That's awesome. It seems I... Uh, so the show or the project has multiple facets, right? Absolutely. Like yeah, we produce two podcasts. We have the Oldest Profession podcast, which does a deep dive into sex workers from history. We have Old Pro News, which covers current events, uh, you know, through the lens of sex worker, uh, sex worker rights. Um, we funded projects across the country, elevating public art and trying to remind communities that sex workers have always been and will continue to be a part of the story. Um, you know, we go to conferences, we publish op-eds, you know, we're, we're doing thought leadership. We're out there trying to identify and activate supporters. And specifically, right we create, you know, sort of persuadable, shareable content um, targeting, you know, the persuadable, but not yet persuaded. There are a lot of folks that recognize that, um, you know, criminalizing and censoring the internet um, is not going to um, eradicate the oldest profession, which not only predates the internet, but also predates money. Um, but, you know, <laughs> right. it's sometimes hard to come up with talking points or facts uh, when you are bombarded with, you know, sex work exclusion, uh, you know, uh, propaganda, frankly, conflating right. erotic expression with violent exploitation, which is the big problem. For sure. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> there's a lot there. <laughs> <laughs> totally. 
Um, so I guess before we get too far into it, uh, what's a little bit about your, uh, from your background, what got you into the old pros? Sure. Yeah. Project? Um, well I came to sex worker advocacy rather reluctantly. Um, I was a stand up comic for almost a decade touring the country, uh, making not a living, uh, but building a life, uh, telling jokes to strangers in basements all over America. Um, but when Donald Trump signed SESTA-FOSTA into law in April of 2018, and SESTA-FOSTA stands for Stop Enabling Sex Trafficking Act and Fight Online Sex Trafficking um, Act, and it's the federal government's latest effort to eradicate um, prostitution from the internet. So this is when Backpage was seized by the FBI. This is when Craigslist went down, Rent Boy, lots of platforms that my you know friends and colleagues had been using to schedule and screen their clients. These are places on the internet that sex workers had invested decades in you know, creating harm reduction, harm reduction tools, right? And sharing that information with each other. So as soon as that happened, I saw the impact in my community immediately, right? People became, Mm -hmm. um, people became homeless, people returned to, uh, you know, abusive relationships, people started engaging in riskier forms of sex work, because the rug had really been pulled out from underneath us. And all of this had been done in the name right, of protecting vulnerable people, when what it did was exasperate the survival, uh, the urgent survival needs of vulnerable people, right? We didn't help a single victim. Uh, We didn't rescue any sex slaves. What we did is we pushed an already uh, criminalized and marginalized community further underground. We know what prohibition does to markets. It doesn't make them safer. And so that was really an activating moment for me. And so I, you know, at that point, I was already running the oldest profession podcast, really, like, you know, as a comedian, <laughs> right, of like, eh, sex workers in history, we're the best, you know, and uh, you can actually kind of hear me get um, radicalized, activated, uh, too angry to be funny, however you want to put it, uh, <laughs> on the podcast, uh, in the immediate aftermath of the passage of Sesta Fosta. And so um, I got more involved in sex worker rights. I accepted the position or I accepted a position as the founding communications director for Decriminalized Sex Work, which is a national advocacy organization. And I spent two years talking to legislators all over the country about what we've gotten wrong with legislation and policies when it comes to sex workers. And I found that politicians are really open to, you know, the detrimental impact of further criminalizing a marginalized community but they're right. also terrified of their own constituents and pushing back against the oldest stigma. And so it became yeah. really clear to me that we aren't going to get anywhere good policy-wise on this until we really invest in culture change. And so I left my, you know, I left decriminalized sex work and I founded Old Pros where we focus on creating content and bringing people from like a really broad uh, you know, broad ideological backgrounds, broad, you know, socioeconomic, cultural backgrounds, but just anyone who thinks it is wrong and dumb to spend taxpayer money sending SWAT teams into immigrant-owned massage parlors to crack down on aggressively consensual hand jobs, right? Like, I don't care where <laughs> you're at on the political spectrum, if we can just get behind uh, ending ending that practice. And so we invested in um, you know, the history podcast, we brought on a PhD historian to help create annotated bibliographies and create more of a resource, right, trying to get these stories out there. Um, we launched Old Pro News. We funded art projects all over the country. We connected to sex workers who are self-organizing all over the country. And we are here to try to preserve uh, that history past and present and to change the story um, about the oldest profession. <laughs> Because we're awesome, of, uh, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Sex workers Some are great. The, <laughs> sure. <laughs> I, I, I often, like, I understand there's a lot of things that people are concerned about, right? Like, uh, I, I hear feminists who are saying, like, that sex workers uh, perpetuate uh, beauty standards that are unattainable or un- un- not not the norm they're just not hanging out with the right sex workers because we uh it's always (laughs) sex workers have always been all kinds of people uh of all genders and all body shapes and all ages actually (laughs) right right yeah Yeah, and i yeah 
and I, I, I actually want to push back further on that and say sure. that um, I believe that horror phobia is the foundation upon which misogyny sits, right? Like without horror phobia, then Mary Magdalene would have been considered a leader in the Christian church. And we would not have been able to create social institutions that legally prohibited women from speaking or preaching for over a thousand years. Sex workers right. have been occupying public spaces and have been in uh, rooms where big decisions have been made hundreds and hundreds of years before the feminist movement made that more accessible uh, to women who were not willing to sacrifice uh, their chastity or their reputation for freedom of movement and freedom of expression. And I mean, sex work is work and it is also sex and it is many things to many people. The acknowledgement that violence and exploitation occurs within the sex industry is not to say that engaging in sex work causes that. Um, I have bad mm -hmm. news for carceral feminists who believe that by eradicating prostitution, we can eradicate exploitation. The, according to the Depart U.S. Department's uh, own labor statistics, the overwhelming majority of people who are violently exploited in this country are trafficked into uh, textiles, are trafficked into mining, are tra trafficked into agriculture, domestic right. servitude. We absolutely have a problem with violent exploitation in this country. The number one source of violently coerced labor in the United States is actually our own prison system. So I am happy to have a conversation about ways to reduce violence and exploitation, but arresting the most vulnerable amongst us isn't going to get us any closer to that goal ever. Yeah, for sure. I, uh, one of the I read the book Revolting Prostitutes a few excellent, years ago. Excellent, excellent work. <laughs> and, and it's one of the – like they make the case that uh, a lot of the uh, women who are, I guess, trafficked into sex work mm -hmm. are immigrants who uh, have been brought over by coyotes and stuff. But they don't – they talk about how the uh, the policy changes for that isn't to make those women into criminals. It's to – change the border situation. I, it, totally. I mean, you want to talk about the systemic ways of ending exploitation. I will also tell you that the over, excuse me, I will also tell you the overwhelming majority of, of, you know, people who are trafficked in the U.S. are in situations that look a lot more like domestic violence then they look like drug trafficking mm -hmm. or other kinds of sort of organized criminal activities. And victims need the same things that victims of domestic violence need, right? We need more shelters, especially for queer youth, especially for vulnerable communities like undocumented immigrants or already over-policed communities. Uh, you know, we need housing, we need health care, we need child care. There are a lot of ways of making vulnerable people less exploitable, and none of them uh, are funding the police departments or like putting more people in cages. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Something that I've encountered a lot online is like, uh, Marxists who, who use their, they talk about how, uh, uh, sex work. <sighs> I'm, I'm trying to remember the argument exactly. Like I can tell you what the <laughs> argument is. Marxists <laughs> believe I'm, it, this is not my first rodeo. Marxists <laughs> believe, or the kinds of Marxists I believe that you're referencing believe, I don't want to paint everyone with a broad brush because there are smart sure. Marxists out there. But uh, these Marxists believe that in a utopia, there would be no sex work, right? Which Post-revolution. Right, yeah. <laughs> cool, dude, except our oldest deities, right, before fiat currency, right, before capitalism, worshipped at the altar of unapologetic whores, right? Ishtar, who is one of the oldest goddesses that we have written records about, right, was born a virgin every morning and went to bed a whore every night. She uh, embodies sort of the duality of feminine power of which, you know, erotic expression is an integral part, right? So like, uh, you know, priestess prostitutes are a part of our, a part of our history um, and stepping into the archetypal whore is something that predates money, predates capitalism, certainly predates industrial capitalism. You want to talk about utopias, I'm really looking forward to a system where we all have the freedom to, uh, to, you know, to have children and to have uh, systems of integrated community care where we can share the labor. But I am confident that all kinds of people are going to be stepping into their Ishtar energy and channeling erotic energy 
uh, for the exchange of money or something of value, even in a utopian future. And if free of uh, yeah. uh, capitalist coercion, I mean, does anyone <laughs> want to go to a party where like sex workers don't exist? You know, like, I mean, like, come on, guys, really think, think about the utopia you're building. Uh, sex workers are the coolest and to try to eradicate us is not wise or good <laughs> or leftist or especially Marxist. Also, Marxist was an insufferable sexist. So there. So there's that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it seems like uh, the, the post-revolution uh, argument, like even if you envision a, a post-revolution without sex workers who are coerced by capitalist needs, sure, right? Totally. That's not the world we live in. Right. So, like, <laughs> so to try to get to that utopian future faster by arresting more of us feels it, yeah. dumb. Just feels dumb. You know, like not strategic. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have to agree with that. It doesn't seem like the best move. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I also look forward to a future where nobody um, engages in exploitative labor. You know, like there are not every job is for everyone. I could never work in a slaughterhouse, for example. But right. I assume that like in a utopian future, there, there are people that will do that work. Same thing with, um, you know, there there. There are a lot of exploitable jobs out there. I understand that prostitution has become a symbol into which we pour all of our nonsense. But if we really want to go after exploitation, let's talk about what we mean um, instead of projecting um, all of our biases into the old, onto the oldest profession. I'm curious. Uh, right now, we're seeing a lot of discourse online about uh, like trans people and grooming, sure. quote unquote grooming. And I'm wondering how that's affecting uh the uh, sex work industry. Moral sex panics have always impacted the sex worker community, the queer community, uh, the kink community, and women generally, right? Uh, white women, right, become the sort of the symbol, right, that is used to justify all kinds of violence in the name of protecting us from exposure to, uh, you know, the amorous right. affections of people outside of, uh, you know, white landowner bros or whatever uh <laughs> yeah. a lot of that you know we become infantilized in that and so there's this this projection of like white women and our children um and it's used to justify all kinds of violence right this was there was a moral sex panic um in the wake of reconstruction right that was like mm -hmm. the uh the energy that really galvanized uh lynching and white terror um, across the, the, the South and also actually um, all over the North. There are sundown towns um, everywhere, it turns yeah. out. Uh, no one is free from their racist history. Um, we saw a, a recent satanic panic um, in the, the wake of the AIDS crisis that really um, characterized uh, the LGBT community as, um, you know, like uh, satanic worshippers of children. And it is... And, and of course, you know, you go all the way back to the medieval period, right, with the blood libel uh, nonsense directed at Jewish communities. And so, like, moral sex panics are not new, right? What is new is the surveillance technology that we have online, which is both allows sort of an unprecedented amount of connection and organizing and also made lots of people vulnerable by you know, making their search history and uh, credit card information <laughs> and Bitcoin, which is something that can never be erased with the, you know, with these erotic exchanges. And so that's why I think it's so important when you're talking about current events, when you're talking about horphobic legislation, you know, to really understand the historical context in which those laws and policies are being proposed. So, yeah. you know, if we had a long history of you know, supporting and protecting children from, say, uh, the Catholic Church's uh, hundreds of years of literal child sex trafficking, um, gymnastic coaches that were reported over and over again. There are yeah. lots of ways of making communities safer for children. None of them have anything to do with targeting LGBT folks, um, targeting, uh, you know, adult consensual erotic laborers, um, or trying to erase um, erotic content from the internet. This isn't going to make our children safer. Making it safer to report, uh, making it easier for folks to get their survival needs met without depending on, um, on, on an abuser, and creating a stronger yeah. social safety net achieves all of those goals 
unfortunately, you don't have a bad guy to arrest, so Americans aren't interested. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. Mm-hmm. Can't put somebody in jail to solve the problem. Yeah, but, right? there are so many issues, it turns out, we can't arrest our way out of. Yeah, yeah. like most of them. Yeah, of them. turns out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And so I think that's like a really important foundational principle for for any leftist to consider is that like any any policy proposal that results in giving more power or more money um, or more resources to, you know, the, the violent arm of the state. I think it's important to step back and ask really big questions about who we're really helping here. Um, because, you know, although after decades and decades and decades of trying, we finally prosecuted the Jeffrey Epstein case, you know, the overwhelming majority of traffickers in this country, um, you know, who are exploiting family members, right, or exploiting acquaintances, um, are exploiting people within their community, right? Like, Taken was yeah. not a documentary. We do not have a roving yeah. bands of strange people you don't recognize kidnapping people after soccer practice. That is not what trafficking or sexual exploitation looks like. Um, it looks like a society that has so shamed and stigmatized, um, you know, erotic expression or gender identity that you've rendered a whole group of folks really vulnerable to violence and abuse. Yeah, for sure. I, uh, one of the things that I, I often push back on or that really frustrates me is that uh, like you get people who are talking very strongly about protecting women, protecting children. But uh, then when victims come forward, they're the first ones to be like, oh, well, where's the evidence? Sure, we don't right. believe yeah. you. <laughs> no, no. They only want to protect women and children by living out their like, I don't know rocky fantasies of like beating up other dudes and then coming super hard or like whatever the machismo (laughs) fantasy is right you want to protect women and children do laundry right engage in public (laughs) health measures that don't kill off large swarms of us right but the the nuclear family is statistically right i'm not making this isn't like some you know feminist propaganda or whatever is literally the most dangerous place for both women and children and so further isolating uh women and children in the home does not increase our safety right it increases our vulnerability to inner interpersonal violence which is you know again like the number one killer of women are men that love them so (laughs) like you know yeah yeah (laughs) <laughs> GA, eh? I wonder <laughs> it's probably bad. Yeah, and so you, you get these like these racist tropes, right, that are really grounded in a very old history of of using, right, a caricature, right, of like white womanhood, right? Um the first federal anti-prostitution law in this country that applied to citizens is the Mann Act. And it was called the right. White Slave Law of 1910. And it made it a federal crime to transport women across state lines for, quote unquote, immoral purposes. So mm-hmm. just like the anti-trafficking laws of today, we did not rescue many sex slaves, but we did prosecute a lot of interracial relationships. And we yep. uh, ruined the day and possible life of many chorus girls. So it's important, I think, again, to look at, you know, what legislators say they're doing. And like, there are a lot of really well-meaning people who work at domestic violence shelters, who provide direct services to people in need. And like, those folks should get funding. Anyone who's providing beds or shelter or advocacy or legal assistance to folks trying to get out of a violent situation. But the, the, the signs in bathrooms and airports saying like, if you see something, say something. We are literally harassing uh, inter interracial families more than we are helping to to advocate victims. You know, you want to help victims, yeah. believe them when they come forward. Uh, don't uh, report random people you think look sketchy uh, to the police. That is not a good or effective way <laughs> of connecting people to the resources that they might need. It's a very good way to get innocent people hurt. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm curious, uh, something that comes up often is uh, discussion of the Nordic model. Sure. Of, uh, so I'm curious, uh, what is the Nordic model and, 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 how, yeah, let's, and how do you view it? Let's get, let's get into it. Uh, <laughs> I, I love this. Yeah. So the Nordic model, um, sometimes referred to as like end demand laws, 
um, entrapment laws. It's also called like the Swedish model. Um, I've heard it called okay. the feminist model, which makes me want to throw up in my mouth. But this, the, the basic theory uh, of this law is grounded in the idea that the overwhelming majority of people um, in the sex industry are victims of violent exploitation and that uh, negotiating consent with a sex worker is the same as violently raping them. And so they seek to criminalize all clients, all third parties um, in the name of, and, and the objective, the like unabashed, uh, clearly stated objective of these laws is to eradicate the sex industry. And hilariously, this is done in the name of protecting and helping sex workers who, if their heads right. were only clearer, they would way rather be doing things like working in textile mills or in low wage, uh, right. low yeah, wage it's, jobs, it's, right? Like, you know, it's minimum just like no wage one explain to them that sex was bad, <laughs> you know, like, so um, the yeah. way that these laws inevitably play out everywhere that end demand uh, policies have been implemented, violence against sex workers goes up. And the reason for this is because it reduces our negotiating power, right? If mm -hmm. we are in a legal system where sex workers are not arrested, but our clients are, it becomes that much harder to get potential clients to give us identifying information, to participate in screenings or reference checks, because we can't tell the difference between a reasonable, rational person who doesn't want to provide a potential undercover cop with identifying information or a predator posing as a client uh, who's trying right. to get away with something. And conflating those two things together is not only an insult to sex workers and victims, but creates a system that does more violence to the very community that these legislators and policymakers are claiming to want to help. Um, the other way that this law plays out is increased stigma and legal barriers uh, to working with sex workers, right? Because landlords um, are targeted. There was something in, um, I believe it was Sweden. It could have been Switzerland because I'm an American. I get those places mixed up. But uh, <laughs> one of those places, uh, something called Operation Homeless, um, helpfully identified sex workers as potential victims and then alerted their landlords to the fact that they were sex workers and let their landlords know that if they weren't evicted within 72 hours, that they themselves would face pimping charges for living right. on the proceeds of a prostitute. Right. Yeah. It makes it impossible to be uh, roommates to do. There, there are all kinds of safety measures that sex workers need to use only within the context of a community. When you criminalize that community, you reduce our ability to self-advocate. You reduce our ability to take steps to keep ourselves safe on the job. So, no, this is not a feminist policy. No, you're never going to eradicate sex work. You can only make it less safe. And no, these policies do not help uh, victims or sex workers. They only make uh, the work less safe and less healthy. Back to uh, Sesta Fosta, that was, I think, one of the points people made when that came out is that now sex workers couldn't communicate amongst themselves about who was safe and who was not Correct. safe. Correct. Yeah. A lot of these messaging boards had places for providers to connect with one another to trade bad date lists, to trade uh, harm reduction tips and techniques. All of that became conflated, right, with promoting prostitution. Platforms became afraid of the liability risks that they incurred by hosting that information. And so now you have like a whole generation of sex workers that are getting into the game without the ability to do what sex workers have done for hundreds of thousands of years before that, which is connect to their older uh, sisters in the trade and exchange information mm -hmm. about how to keep themselves safe. Yeah, that's not... Uh, I, that's not progress. For, <laughs> that doesn't sound like progress to me. That nope. sounds like endangering people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I guess that Nordic model, like, is that's kind of also the difference between legalization and decriminalization. No, those are different. So, okay, that's yeah, different. So that's, a, that's, a, that's an important to say. You're, you're hitting all the highlights, Corey. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for preparing. This is perfect. Yeah, so um, it's important to distinguish legalization from decriminalization, right? So decriminalization is what sex workers all over the world are asking for, which is to remove criminal penalties for engaging in this work, meaning that no one should be arrested, evicted, fired, or lose custody of their child for engaging in this work. What legalization right. does is it creates a regulatory structure that essentially creates a legal monopoly. And it takes all of the mm. power of the state and all of the power of like pimps or managers or madams or third parties or whatever and concentrates it 
uh, amongst a, a, a select few, right? So Nevada is the best example of this, right? So Nevada is the only state in the United States with legal regulated prostitution, and it has right. the highest arrest rate per capita for prostitution related offenses. And the reason for that is because it is uh, maybe not impossible, but often inadvisable to work in a brothel where you have to legally register with the sheriffs as a licensed prostitute, right? Which is a subpoenable fact about you for the rest of your life. You can imagine how this comes up in child custody cases. Um, you have to be hired by a brothel, which are like no notoriously misogynistic, uh, you know, sort of white supremacist spaces uh, that, you know, so if you are a, uh, you know, disabled person, if you're a person of color, if you like don't fit into uh, the rather narrow scope of like female beauty standards that, you know, feminists think that sex workers are upholding when really it's no, it's a whole different, it's it's a whole different conversation, <laughs> right? That's not on us. Uh, so, yeah, um, yeah, so if you if you don't fit within that, if you're not willing to give 50% of your money to the brothel, if you're not willing to pay sort of the exorbitant fees that are associated with working there, like room and board and supplies that they make you uh, buy, or if you're just unwilling to work like 12, 14, 24-hour shifts for some dude, right? Like if you, like, if you just don't want to be working at a place yeah. with a boss and a manager because like that's not your scene then it then is you're not allowed then it's impossible <laughs> for you to work legally in nevada and like the thing that drew me to sex work was the flexible schedule being my own boss sort of an entrepreneurial spirit um and i would hate working at a brothel for all of the same reasons that i hated working at a restaurant <laughs> yeah you got a boss bosses suck bosses <laughs> suck right yeah and so you know, and so in Nevada, it's, you know, it's impossible to work legally in Reno um, or Las Vegas where the highest demand is. And like, I would be much more open to legal protections or creating, you know, some kind of licensing or regulatory scheme if we didn't live in such a notoriously and deeply whorephobic culture. It's right. really important to remember that any laws constructed around this are not going to be coming from a place of increasing safety and negotiating powers of workers, but rather sort of os isolating, ostracizing, um, and ultimately erasing us, right? So like, I don't feel comfortable encouraging anyone to get on any stigmatized lists in this country. I don't encourage right. anyone to trust their personal identifying uh, data or information around this, this stigmatized issue to anyone, but of course, least of all a, a government agency. So, you know, I think it's important to think about sex work through the prism of the LGBTQ plus fight, right? Like when we stopped arresting people for being gay, we didn't create like a homosexual registry, right? We didn't make people right. fill out bureaucratic forms to do butt stuff with their buddy, right? We just stopped arresting people for engaging in consensual sex, right? Which, you know, people were able to report rapes, People were, are uh, able to report violence. People are able to do lots of other things. But, you know, sex work is work, but it is also sex. And so I think it's really important to recognize that, like, barriers to access here create barriers to safety. We want mm. to stop arresting people for engaging in consensual sexual activities, whether money is exchanged or not, right? You want to talk about licenses for brick-and-mortar establishments, right? Brothels that employ, employ more than a few people, Strip clubs, I think, are an obvious example here. Uh, there are already legal forms of sex work that engage in sort of like regulations. That's fine. Uh, you know, rules around advertising. Like, I get why no one wants a billboard with like, I, you know, there, there's some sure. stuff here. But you really don't want to create a system where a vulnerable person who isn't licensed, who didn't register, who didn't fill out their paperwork, faces a violent situation exchanging erotic services for money and either can't report that um, or is made more vulnerable because she didn't do her paperwork. You know what I mean? Like the, we really yeah, want to yeah. make sure that we're protecting um, individual, <laughs> frankly, amateur uh, folks that right, engage uh, in this work. Yeah. And it's like, not like uh, everyone who goes into sex work is also an accountant. Right. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> exactly. And there are a lot of good reasons. Yes. So yeah, you get it. <laughs> you get it. So it's a, uh, yeah, I, I wonder, cause I understand like a lot of people, they're concerned about, uh, they've seen the images on movies and whatnot of the pimp. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, 
picking up a poor girl who is on the street in New York City or what have you. Sure. And so, uh, let's I wonder, talk about it. Have we addressed uh, whether like is that a danger? Are there people who are yeah. Uh, being exploited in that way? Sure. So so pimps, I think it's important to say right up front, is sort of like a racialized term uh, yeah. for I, you know for, <laughs> for a role for a very legitimate role in the the criminalized sex industry. But you sure. do not see men, frankly, in the sex work economy filling the role that we would sort of then come to call pimp before right. criminalization, right? Before criminalization, the overwhelming majority of sex workers are sort of run or managed through madams, right, at brothels that also served as, um, you know, madams were like the largest landowners in the West for a few decades right. there before we criminalized the older, you know, yeah. women entrepreneurs, too successful, can't have that. That's going to be, that's going to put a, a crimp in <laughs> everything that we do. Um, but yeah, so the, what happened was we, um, you know, we isolated sex workers during the Victorian period by forcing them into red light districts and brothels. Um, we then, uh, during the progressive era, criminalized those brothels and shut them all down. And then when World War I came around, we deputized local law enforcement to arrest any, any woman suspected of promiscuity because STIs were an existential threat to our soldiers, right? So we wanted to protect our soldiers from an STI threat. Yeah. And the only way that we can do that is by cracking down on sex workers. <laughs> So, <laughs> so when it became literally dangerous, right, for women to be, um, to, to move in public, right, to solicit clients, then you needed a male figure uh, to protect those sex workers, not from dangerous clients, right, not from would-be rapists or abusers, but from the police. And so right. that has been the role of the the, the so-called pimp. And then like, you know, the black exploitation films of the 1970s and like yeah. are there have been several racialized moral panics. Right. Remember, like the super predators of the 90s and like all of that sort of fed into this mythology. But the pimp figure and specifically the power to violently exploit. Right. The people that work for them is a direct result of criminalization. If you no longer fear the police, then you can at least negotiate a better situation. Love that stuff goes away, right? even, yeah. even if you don't want to schedule your own clients, even if you don't want, you know, even if you want to outsource that shit, which I totally get, right? You can hire a manager that isn't going to violently exploit you because they cannot threaten you with the violence of the state. Right, right. Yeah, it's the same, like, often, <laughs> I, I get, I, I'm an anarchist. So uh, the state is kind of the bad guy yeah, in my totally. mind. <laughs> <laughs> so Same all of this thing. just seems confirmatory. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, it's uh So I guess uh we're coming up it's 35ish minutes so mm -hmm. we could go into the counter propaganda. It's uh you say uh trafficking most of what we think is recycled from long debunked myths about white sla slavery. Correct. Um I remember uh, when I, it's had to be 99, 2000, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was, there was talk about, uh, if you went on, a, if white women went on a cruise, then they would be kidnapped by pirates and sold into sex slavery. Amazing. <laughs> right, like our pussy's just not that good. You know what I mean? Like we've been sold, <laughs> we have been sold a load of shit, frankly, about like how amazing or whatever <laughs> white women are. And it's like, no, there are, we, <laughs> People, women, children do not need to be kidnapped, right, and violently forced at gunpoint or some other coercion into this work. There are enough volunteers. Everywhere you go, there are perfectly reasonable, attractive people who would rather be exchanging erotic services to get their survival needs met than working at a textile mill, working as a, at a restaurant, right? 1010 can confirm. Uh, <laughs> you know, so like, it, you, it, it, we have this myth that is really grounded in this false belief that sex is one of the worst things that can happen to a person. And <laughs> it's yeah, bananas yeah. to me that we keep having that conversation with fully functioning adults that have like a full and active sex life themselves. And they're like, no, 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 no. If we introduce money to this, it becomes the worst thing in the world. Yeah, that's right. 
<laughs> it, it transforms sex into coerced sex. Totally. <laughs> and like coerced sex is bad, but so is every other form of violence. And again, if we want to crack down on violent exploitation, there are real steps that we can do to do that. But criminalizing the consensual exchange of erotic services is not and has never been one of them. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I had a conversation a, a few weeks ago with somebody who said that they were on board with the online, uh, like, e-girl type uh, sex work. But full service sex work, they, they were fully against that. And it seemed like there was a bit of a disconnect there for me. Like, if... If there's exploitation in one, then it's exploitation in both, right? And I if mean, it's not... everyone uh, gets to negotiate their own boundaries, right? Yeah, so for like sure. So like I, for, for sure. example, as a full-service sex worker, I'm way more comfortable negotiating consent one-on-one one -on -one with a human being that I can see in the room, right? That's my right. preference. Rather than providing images, right, on the wild west of the internet, right, where I have no idea or no control about what could happen to those images after, you know, our exchange, right? Yeah. I'm often negotiating with an anonymous person, right? I don't, I don't know and have no way of like trusting, you know, who, who I have a transaction with. Um, you know, there are, there are folks that work in, you know, uh, brick and mortar places like massage parlors or strip clubs, right? Where they don't want to do any advertising. They don't want to do any one-on-one -on -one negotiation. They want to show up, go to work, do a shift and go back. So Everyone kind of has their own preferences that they're negotiating within. Sure. And that's why, I mean, sex work is so many things to so many people. But what it sounds like is this person is like skeeved out or whatever at the idea of physical contact with another human person. And then this, but they could see why, you know, you know, like masturbating in front of your camera is not violently exploitation, which like good on them. Like great to great to take the We're leap there one. that like how jerking yourself like in the privacy of your own home is like maybe not the most violently exploitative thing that you could ever <laughs> engage in. Um, but, you know, like I wonder if this person how they feel about massage therapy. I wonder how this person feels about the entirety of the medical profession. Like there are lots of human contact J-O-B jobs out there that involve way grosser stuff than semen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you should, I, yeah. I'm friends with lots of nurses and you should hear the stories. Well, even like, <laughs> I worked in fast food restaurants and some of the stuff you deal with in totally. fast food restaurants is pretty gross. <laughs> I had to clean up human feces when I worked as at a Starbucks on 53rd right. and Lex. Like, that's something I never would have consented to as a for sex minimum worker. wage, bro. Yeah, for yeah, for <laughs> not for not enough money and not enough health care. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um. Well, I don't know. Is there anything that we haven't covered that uh, we should talk about? I mean, I want to say like if you're if you're intrigued by this topic, uh, I I'd really encourage you to check out our work at oldprosonline.org. We have a newsletter that goes out every Friday. That's a roundup of sex worker rights related news, um, events that sex worker organizations um, are hosting. We talk about the content that we're producing. You know, if you want to learn more about sex workers from history, there's a lot of good stuff. Uh, we're um, online at oldprosonline.org. Awesome. I, uh, I listen to the podcast regularly and it's, I quite enjoy the history of it. Uh, Thank you. It's, uh, it's, it's really interesting. I think. A lot of people could probably take a, a page and actually learn something about like the, it's a very Puritan culture within America and Canada totally. as well. Like, yeah. and maybe if we were a little less ashamed of sex, we wouldn't be so. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, like maybe we could be more ashamed of the racism. You know what I mean? Like if we're going to crack right. down on something, but like, I don't know, titties out is just not like, I don't know, a national security emergency. Right. Right. I guess I don't want to, I just listened to something not that long ago about, uh, uh, what is it? The male gaze in movies and whatnot and, and how it, well, uh, yeah. Cause it's guys behind the camera. The solution right. to that is more female directors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. And how, uh, these, the male gaze has kind of painted a lot of our current perceptions about women and, and sex and, and whatnot. And, and, uh, yeah, it was really informative to, to me, but also like sometimes it had like an anti-sex work kind of mm -hmm. bent to it. And I didn't really 
I don't know. I don't jive with that so much. <laughs> totally. I mean, like, yeah, we live in a misogynistic culture. We live in a white supremacist culture. We live in a, a colonialist culture, right? Like we are swimming in the the water of of many problematic beliefs that have been handed down to us over the course of hundreds of years, right? Um, but sex workers, uh, rather than sort of contributing to like the patriar- patriarchal false beliefs, actually serve as sort of counter uh, counter messaging. Uh, Barbara right. Brents just completed an incredible uh, sociological study um, on clients of sex workers, and she found rather shockingly, that men that self-report having, uh, you know, engaged with professional sex workers, right, you know, using their services, self-report more feminist beliefs than men that don't. Um, As I said before, sex workers have been in spaces, right, that feminists have been fighting to get into for all of human history. Sex workers have been a big part of the conversation. And the stigma and criminalization of sex work has done more to exclude women from public spaces than really anything else. It is actually horphobia, right? Um, I mean, think about it, right? Public woman is a euphemism for prostitution, but it also literally means visible woman, right? Woman right. participating in the public discourse. And so when you tie uh, women fully engaging, right, in the public square, right, with a dangerous promiscuity or whatever, you create the foundational beliefs that have been used to exclude women from public spaces. So horophobia and misogyny are deeply tied. Uh, and I think that by eradicating and questioning and pushing back on one, you end up pushing back and sort of dissolving the other. I don't think it's possible to maintain misogynistic beliefs, right? if you are willing to let go of horophobia, right? If you let go of the idea that the kinds of sex or the circumstances uh, that people engage in is not the full measure of their worth as people, then a lot of the false beliefs that limit the freedom of movement and freedom of expression of women um, and, you know, gender nonconforming folks dissipates because we have less to police. Yeah. I, uh, when you're talking about that, it made me think of like the reaction that, women who are politicians often get mm-hmm. be- just by existing yeah, in the when Donald Trump uh, called public- Hillary Clinton a nasty woman, right? He was calling her a whore, right? It doesn't right. matter if you've ever engaged in sex work. It doesn't matter if you've ever participated yeah. in the exchange of erotic labor, uh, you know, for, for money or something of value. People can just call you a whore for talking because that's what that word used to mean, right? Is mm. women that talk. So, you know, are, I find the, you know, sort of, uh, carceral feminist strand, uh, within the feminist movement deeply confusing. Um, it hurts, it hurts a lot to see, you know, would be allies hurling, um, gross or phobic insults at their, their sisters in arms when we are fighting for a future where people of all genders can fully participate and fully pursue their passions, no matter what their genitals look like or what kind of, of sex they've ever engaged in. That I think is something that we can all work towards. Yeah, for sure. Well, I thank you very much for your time. I you already mentioned Old Pros Online. Is there anywhere else online that people can? Yeah, find totally. More Check stuff? out Old Pros Online. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Old Pros Online. Um, you can find me also. Uh, you know, I'm Caitlin Bailey. It's spelled weird. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I really encourage you to like sign up for the newsletter, follow us on social media and like, you know, start educating yourself about sex workers in history. Uh, sex workers really are, I think the canary in the coal mine when it comes to civil liberties, right? Like, you know, SESTA FOSTA is just the beginning of, um, erasing the, the free internet. And so, um, you know, if you believe in freedom of expression, if you believe in bodily autonomy, um, and if you believe that arresting people for engaging in aggressively consensual sex is like, at best, a waste of taxpayer resources, then you're already a sex worker rights advocate. So like, get educated, get involved, uh, and help us out. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for having me, Corey. It's been a blast. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. It's really appreciated and it helps me spend more time on this and my other projects. 
If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a five-star rating or a re- and a review on the podcast app of your choice or on one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser or RateMyPodcast.com would be great. If you want to find more from me, make sure to check out the show notes or check out my link tree. That's linktr.ee slash skeptical court. You can find all my social media stuff there, as well as links to my other show, From Many People's Strength, which is a podcast about Saskatchewan politics, and a project I'm involved in with my friend Damien Marie at Hope that's called Atheist Humanist Leftist Revolutionaries. My Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty, and my Facebook page is The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. You can email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. And if you want to be a guest on the show or know someone I should reach out to, then feel free to let me know. You can book interviews in my available time slots on my Calendly, which is also found in my link tree. Thanks so much for listening, and let's try to make sure we're applying critical thinking and reasoned skepticism when we're attacking the system. If we get caught up in bad thinking, we can derail ourselves.